Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Mike Missanelli blog. You can catch the Mike Missanelli blog every Friday right here on my website, MikeMiss.com, where I kind of go over the stuff that has happened this week, whether it be in sports or otherwise. And it just so happens that the, this week we had a real monumental thing happen in the city of Philadelphia, and that was a no-hitter uh, by Michael Lorenzen, of all people, his second start with the Phillies, his first start at Citizens Bank Ballpark, and Ian Farrell's a, a no-hitter, which was really an unusual and unique night because it started out with Weston Wilson, a career minor leaguer, getting his first at-bat in the major leagues and hitting a home run on the third pitch he saw. Uh, and that really was the story. And also the sub-story, I think it was Nick Castellanos hitting two home runs in that game to get him to 200 as he's back on fire again. But let's look at the no-hitter because so many things to unpack about a no-hitter in this day and age. You rarely see a manager extend a pitcher to that amount of pitches, even to complete a no-hitter. The era in baseball has changed. These pitchers that are reared in the minor leagues are not reared to throw that many pitches. The 100-pitch mark is usually the breakwater uh, part, and, and they managers look off of that because they don't want to overwork a pitcher. In this day and age, let's face it, you're throwing a lot harder. You're putting a lot more torque on your arm. So you know, the old school people say, oh, those guys used to throw 150 pitches back in the day. Well, it's a different era, man. Uh, you know, you're a 95 mile per hour plus pitcher now in Major League Baseball, and it takes a lot of strain out of your arm. So that said, let's examine what happened in this game, because I tweeted out something and people came and attacked me. And I was just tweeting out the reality of the situation. He had completed seven innings and he was at uh, 100 pitches. Now, after seven and 100 pitches, you're thinking, okay, well, there's no way that they're going to allow him to complete nine. Even if they send him out for another inning, they're still not going to let him complete a no-hitter in this day and age. Because the last time, actually, a pitcher had thrown as many pitches as Michael Lorenzen threw, which I think was 124 at the end of the day, was eight years ago, which gives you an idea on how managers protect pitchers these days. So at 100 pitches, I'm thinking, okay, they're, they're thinking about the health of this guy because, you know, you know there, there's a – an old adage, uh, Rafael Santana completed a no-hitter, and he threw like a 135 to 140 pitches, and it kind of ruined them. So there's an example out there. You don't want to overwork a pitcher. It's really difficult to recover from that, A. And, B, you, your arm gets tired in the last couple innings if you're over 100 pitches and you're trying to exert more energy to throw the ball as hard, which, which takes a little out of your arm, and that's where you can get injured. So Rob Thompson was faced with a decision, which is a really interesting decision. You know, I thought there's no way he, since the, the thinking is there's no way he's going to complete nine, because if he completes nine, that'll get him into the 120s. And we just don't do that anymore. So he talked to him, interestingly enough, after the seventh inning and asked Lorenzen whether he was good to go. Now, I, I don't think there's a pitcher on earth that's going to say no in that situation. The guy's got a no hitter. He's not going to tell his manager he's gassed. He's going to want to go out there. So it's kind of a loaded question, and you know what answer you're going to get. So it's up to the manager really to make that kind of decision. So at that point, even though Lorenzo said he was good to go, Thompson still had to make that decision. And I got to give the guy credit because he chanced it. A no-hitter is such a rare achievement for somebody, uh, and it's something you're going to have the rest of your life. So you owe it to the guy to achieve that at the expense of maybe we're going too long with the guy and we're going to risk injury. So he lets him go out for the eighth. And what he said after the game was he had 20 pitches. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, because once you commit to send the guy out for the eighth inning, you're committing to, to see him through the whole game. And uh, can you imagine if he had gotten through eight innings, more than 20 pitches, and for the ninth inning, Rob Thompson takes him out of the game. It would have been hell to pay for Rob Thompson, and I think he knew it. So I think he was crossing his fingers that Lorenzo could complete it with a reasonable amount of pitches. Now, he gets through the eighth, and, of course, when he comes out for the ninth, he gets a standing ovation from the fans that spurs him on, and he completes the no-hitter. Now, I'm telling you, I was shocked that he was allowed to go back for the eighth inning. Once he got through the eighth, there's no way you take him out of that game, and you let him go for the no-hitter, which he did. And Lorenzo completed one of the great nights in Citizens Bank Park history, really, when you think about it, with those three monumental things that happened. The rookie who comes up in his first at-bat in Major League hits the home run with his family there and his dad actually crying at the emotion of the moment. And then you had the wife there and the whole bit. And then Lorenzo 
throws the no hitter and his family is there, including his wife and his mother. And they're brought to tears. And in the middle of that is Nick Castellano's son, Liam, running all over the place <laughs> as his dad hit his 200th home run in the major league. So really a special night at Citizens Bank Ballpark. But again, the circumstance of being allowed to complete a no-hitter was the interesting part of that and how managers just don't do that anymore. And Thompson took a chance and it paid off into a memorable moment. So I'll give the guy credit. Now, of course, the other side of that, had it gone bad, there would have been hell to pay for Rob Thompson, but it didn't. So we'll just focus on uh, the Lorenzen no-hitter and, of course, the Weston Wilson home run and the Nick Castellanos uh, two home runs. And it looks like he's back on the beam. And it looks like, folks, as I've been saying pretty much all year in this video blog on MikeMiss.com, that the Phillies are a lock for the playoffs. And I know there was a lot of fretting that was going on. Their lineup is just better than anybody else that they're competing for in that wild card spot. I mean, let's face it. They're, they're a more solid team. They're a more solid team than the Giants, more solid than Cincinnati Reds, even the Chicago Cubs who are making a run, the Miami Marlins. You know, those teams that don't compare lineup-wise with the Philadelphia Phillies. So, now what you have is a little bit of a situation as far as what your outfielders are. Johan Rojas has played great center field. I think he's going to stick with the team for the rest of the year. Now, will he be the everyday center fielder? That means Marsh has to be a left fielder where he's not as good as a left fielder as he is a center fielder. And would they then put a right-handed bat in there if they have Schwarber as the full-time DH, Harper as the full-time first baseman, the left field situation is going to be Marsh pretty much on a full-time basis with an occasional right-handed batter against a left-handed pitcher and who will that right-handed batter be will it be Christian Pache who's coming off the IL well Weston Wilson stick because let's face it he's got a little more pop than Pache he's more of a home run hitter you could probably get away with playing him a couple of days a week in left field uh, and then you would have to drop somebody to minor league so who would they option out is the big question for Rob Thompson going forward uh, the other concern well maybe it's the back end of the bullpen now Kimbrell has pitched a lot of innings. Soto has pitched a lot of innings. Dominguez is trying to struggle back and get in there. They do have Brogdon and Bellotti in AAA. So we'll see how that uh, the, you know, seventh, eighth inning turns out and what they're going to do with the closer situation if Kimbrell is overloaded with work. Uh, that's the concern. But I have no concern about them being in the playoffs. And, and who they're going to play is just a matter of conjecture. Now, are they as good as the Braves? No, they're not. But they weren't as good as the Braves, in my opinion, last year. And you saw what happened. The Braves crumbled in the playoffs. Well, they did that again. I mean, who knows? They're a more together team with their pitching staff getting healthy again. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. Once you get into the playoffs in a short series, anything can happen. You can beat a better team in, in uh, four of seven games or three or five games. So I don't have any worries about that particular situation. We'll get there when we get there. Now, we are going into a Philadelphia Eagles season. And tomorrow night, we get a first look, actually, uh, preseason game. They finally start playing a game and get a better idea, although they're probably not going to play a lot of starters. But there are some, some situations and some positions that I'm looking at closely. And one is the linebacker situation, and the other is the safety position. The linebacker situation, I know it's been kind of scattershot in, in training camp, and, and the Kobe Dean has been out for a while. And the big question is, can the Kobe Dean be a starter? The fact that the Eagles went out and acquired two other linebackers to compete for the position Maybe tells me they're not liking 100% what they're seeing from the Kobe Dean. So we'll have to wait on that particular situation. And he's been banged up, so I'm not sure he's going to play tomorrow either. And we won't get a good indication until probably the middle two games about the linebacker position. But think about that. This is what we're quibbling about. One particular position on a team that's pretty loaded elsewhere. And uh, I'm not trying to be a homer. I never was a homer. But the reality of the situation is the Eagles are the best team in the NFC. And the odds reflect that. They are favored to win the NFC. They are certainly a big-time favorite to win their division. And whether they get to the Super Bowl, we shall see. It helps to get the number one seed if you're going to go to the Super Bowl. And I do believe the Eagles, unless it's the 49ers coming from nowhere with that quarterback situation, the Eagles, to me, will be the number one seed going to the playoffs that way, which is a major advantage. All right, now on the Mike Missinelli blog on Fridays, we do a, a couple categories, and one of the categories we do is what's bugging Mike, okay? So what's bugging Mike it is uh, an editorial that I read in the Philadelphia Inquirer from somebody who is uh, who wants the practice of the flying airplane banner ads cut out. Now, I don't know how long you've been going down to Jersey Shore. I've been going down for a really long time, and I 
cut my teeth on Wild in New Jersey uh, as a summer vacation every year with my parents, the same week, every year, the same hotel. And one of the things that was a landmark of the Wildwood Beach were those flying little airplane ads and streaming ads that would, would fly by. So you like eat at Joe's, uh, the $3 off uh, happy hour wings or whatever it is. And you would even see some proposals like, uh, Janie, will you marry me? Uh, sincerely, Rod, or wh whatever you saw. It was, it was kind of the charm of the Jersey Shore. I can't imagine anybody that's going to be upset at maybe a little bit of a roar of a twin engine airplane going by for about 15 seconds. I mean, come on. This is like a classic old man get off my lawn lament. Um, that's part of Americana. Let's face it. Jersey Shore, for all of us who grew up here in Philadelphia area, uh, is where we go on vacation. And part of that was the old time where they used to sell the fudgy wudgies on the beach. <laughs> but they're gone now. But the airplane banners ads were, were a staple of the Jersey Shore. So I don't know. I, I can't understand anybody who would complain about that. And and that's my uh, my beef of the week. And what's bugging me is anybody who would actually complain about something like that. Come on, man. How is that inconveniencing you? Are you going to tell me about the pollution of the airplane? All right. Maybe you got a, a, a little bit of a point there. The noise. My God, you're on the beach. The noise. I mean, there's noise all the time. There's all this white noise from seagulls and from people yakking next to you and from the, the ocean surf. I mean, noise is part of the Jersey Shore Beach. It's peaceful, but there is noise. And uh, so I go, listen, keep those airplanes uh, in forever. Uh, I don't know if they're actually uh, as plentiful as they used to be, but I'm OK with it. And I remember the, the copper tone ad with the the, the little girl pulling down her, her pants and she's got a white butt uh, from being sunburned. That's the copper thought ad. You remember they used to fly by all the time. Uh, and I remember one particular, when I was in my heyday, it was a, a couple of clubs down there. One was called the playpen. It was called the penalty box. And it was a band called money that used to play at the penalty box every weekend. And you'd see that banner go by catch money tonight at the penalty box at nine at 9 PM at, uh, at the, at the penalty box, hey, whatever. So anyway, uh, I know that most of you agree with me on that. And if you agree, send me an email at mike at mikemiss.com, which we'll get to in a second because I have another winner of the Mike Miss Sound Off contest right here on mikemiss.com. But first, um, let's talk about the quirky story of the week. And this is a quirky story as much as this, a story that kind of made my eyes raise a little bit. Now, Henry Ruggs, former wide receiver for the Denver Broncos out of Alabama, um, was convicted of vehicular homicide, and he's going away for three to 10 years now. Uh, he was going 156 miles an hour. He was drunk. His blood alcohol was twice of what it should have been in Denver, and he killed a person. So um, I thought it was really interesting that the Devontae Smith, the Eagles wide receiver, actually went to the sentencing as a show of support for a guy that he played football with. Now, what exactly are you supporting, Devontae? Uh, yeah, OK, you knew him at one point, but um, are you sanctioning the fact that he did this I and mean, he was convicted? What show of support uh, are you giving him? You know, if you want to write him a letter, that's fine. Once he's in prison, maybe you want to give him a telephone call. But for you to be in the courtroom to support a man who just got fit, convicted uh, of a murderous act, I, it struck me as a little odd, to be honest with you. And I know that, that people here love Devontae Smith, and, and this is not meant to criticize him at all as a player or as a person. I just thought it was bad judgment for him to do something like that. Uh, that's just my opinion on that. Obviously, he's got his own personal opinion on supporting Henry Ruggs, but Henry Ruggs is going to jail for a heinous act. So I, I don't know what why he would need support in that particular situation. All right. So that... It's pretty much the gist of today's video blog, except for our last item that we will take care of. Now, I've been talking about this for a while on the video blog, where I used to do a thing on the radio when I was at the Fanatic. The last 15 minutes of, of the radio show was something called Sound Off, where we would take our voice calls, the people that left messages on our voice line, to talk about anything, really, anything sports-oriented, anything life-oriented, anything that was good. Uh, and it would play it. I would never I would not hear it until it was played on the air. And then I would have uh, my response. But we're trying to rekindle that right here on MikeMiss.com. If you write me an email in that kind of a form, in that kind of a sound off form, if you remember how we did that, uh, you are going to be selected to win 
the Mike Masnelli podcast hat. Of course, you can catch my podcast sponsored by Bet Rivers. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays is when we release the podcast. But there's the hat. It's really nice. That's a khaki colored hat. This is a red one. As you can see, there's the logo, the Mike Masnelli podcast logo. And, and all you have to do to win one of these is to write me something that gets my attention. Write an email that gets my attention. And subjectively, I will choose the winners. We've had a couple of winners already. And so uh, here, here is uh, my winner of this week. And this is not to endorse anything politically. It's just a, an example of what you can write about. You can write about sports. You can write about politics. You can write whatever. If you get my attention to, as a good email in a sound off form, uh, you're going to be selected to win the hat. So as you know, uh, in, in the past, I've taken a lot of heat because uh, I'm an anti Donald Trump guy. I, I just, I just don't understand where this country is going in support of this guy. Uh, he's a, a kind of a, he's a heinous, despicable man, in my opinion, that set this country back many years. So I, I don't want to see him get reelected. Uh, uh, whether he goes to jail is a matter of conjecture. He'll probably slide out of that as well. Uh, but I, I, I was uh, I've always been outspoken on that because I thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, and a lot, a lot of people don't think it's the right thing to do. So I understand that part of it. But um, this letter was written to me by a guy named uh, Nick Gambino. And uh, what I get a lot on my Twitter when I'll tweet something political, which is really not political, it's just anti-Trump. I'm not really anti-Republican, uh, except if you're a, a Trump guy, which I don't understand your support for the guy. I always get. Hey, Mike, stick to sports. And, and that's, it's really confusing why people do that, because anybody on Twitter can opine about anything. Like if you're a machinist, you don't have to tweet about your work to, as a machinist. You tweet uh, what your thoughts are. And that's what I do. So, like, I, I, I don't want to be peg hole as just a sports guy. I'm a human being with opinions on a lot of things in life. I happen to be an attorney. So I think I have a, pretty much a, an intelligent view when I put something out there. But anyway, Nicholas Gambino writes the following. Um, he says, first of all, he, he had sent me a, an email uh, a long time ago, and he said, I just want to drop you a line letting you know that I always appreciate your commenting on what's happening in our country instead of ignoring it to please the sponsors. I listen to and enjoy your show, and I think it's important for public figures like yourself who have a platform not to sit idly by while a tyrant like Trump threatens our democracy and promotes racism, misogyny, xenophobia, and hatred. All right, and then uh, the second part of this is that the other thing he, he writes that always bothers me was how people would say stick to sports. Yet Trump attacked Kaepernick, Fox's Laura Ingram told LeBron to shut up and dribble, and Trump and the wacky right wouldn't shut up about BLM while athletes were wearing various apparel in support of the indictment. It did involve sports, and you were right to talk about it. And so, so were they. So they had the opinion on that, and I had the opinion on it as well, even though I'm a so-called sports guy. Well, anyway, he goes on to say that uh, I remember when 9-11 happened and radio personalities were discussing it, even though they weren't on news stations. Uh, the president being impeached twice and investigated for trying to fix an election can't be brought up. It's human. It's human nature. It's human life. Sports radio does miss you, he says. It's sad that you had to pay a price for telling the truth and speaking out against tyrants. I don't see how 97.5 survives. Well, listen, I, I'm I'm not saying that I'm no longer there because I spoke the truth. Uh, I'm no longer there probably for, for a lot of reasons, maybe one of them being financial with the, the station in the financial shape it's in. Um, and I really haven't spoken out on on that and, and told the whole story as to why I'm no longer at the Fanatic. And for me, it's like at this point, what's the point? Does anybody really care? So I pretty much passed it by. Uh, but the Nick uh, Gambino is going to be the winner of the Mike Missinelli podcast hat. And Nick, send me send me an email on what color you would want, and I'll get it in the mail to you right away. Okay, that concludes the Mike Missinelli blog, or as we call it, the vlog, the video blog on MikeMiss.com. Don't forget to check in every Friday uh, on the video blog and uh, check in on the website, MikeMiss.com, to see what's happening with Mike Miss. And don't forget to listen to the podcast. We do it every Tuesday and Thursday, the Mike Missinelli podcast on any podcast network you have. Okay. Thanks everybody for watching and listening and we will talk to you next week. Take care everybody.